Welcome to Keys TV News. I'm Sophie Whitfield. And I'm Jimmy Mackerel. We start today in the wake of the tragic killing of Alan Henning by Islamic State last week. The Salford taxi driver was affectionately nicknamed Uncle Gadget during his humanitarian role in Syria. His death has prompted a very powerful reaction. On Sunday night, people of all faiths and backgrounds gathered in Manchester's Piccadilly Gardens to celebrate Alan's life. Taxi drivers across Salford are displaying yellow ribbons showing solidarity with Alan's family. Each year in the UK, 80,000 people find themselves homeless. IT and business workers braved the cold in aid of charity as the largest sleep out in the country took place at Media City UK last week. Amelia Mancheva reports. Beds for one night under the open sky at Media City UK to raise funds for youth homelessness. There are young children, 16, younger, just slightly older, that, are, that have no home, no family support, no network around them, which I find alien because I've, you know, I've got a great family and lots of lots of friends who help me and could never imagine my little girl being on the streets. Would never ever want that to happen to her or anybody else's child. Coronation Street star Brooke Vincent reflects from a scene where she had to portray a homeless person on the streets of Manchester. We was literally sat on the floor for a scene that's two pages long and it's freezing and it's horrible and it's not pleasant one bit and you just really, really think that you can deal with it for that amount of time, whereas people that have to deal with it constantly. Bight Night is the largest charity sleep out in the UK and has raised more than six million pounds for action for children since 1998. So my message to everyone here tonight is just um, be grateful because tomorrow we're all going to be back in our beds, in warm homes, with food in the cupboards, and we're going to be safe and secure. So we ought to be grateful for that, because many of these kids don't even have that. Armed with only the thermos on their body and a sleeping bag, the technical enthusiasts try to sleep for the night, facing the cold and the rain. We caught up with them the following morning to capture their reactions to the ordeal. When your head goes very close to the concrete, I did then start to think, oh my God, this is what it's like to sleep outside. This is, you, you're right next to your head on more or less on the pavement. I'm feeling like I need my toothpaste. Um, I'm, I'm tired, but I, and I'm a little sore, but I'm happy. After experiencing life on the street, the fundraisers were blessed with the reality of home comforts health should be treated the same as physical health by 2020. Well, that's the message from Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg. He set out a five-year plan and Penny James has spoken to Manchester's representative for the mental health charity Mind. I would say that mental health affects everybody and mental health doesn't exist in a vacuum. Um, it exists in real people's realities in everyday life. Um, so you can say we're tackling stigma, you can say we're improving access to um, talking therapies and that's brilliant but unless you also address the needs of those people, um, whether that be housing, access to education, um, access to welfare when they are unwell, unless you address that holistically, you're never going to have a complete solution. Latest on the regeneration in Pendleton and big plans for the shopping centre. Jim Scott has more. The home of Salford Shopping Centre is over 40 years old and now the council have said time is up. New plans have been drafted to replace the existing complex which is set to include a number of new businesses and boost the local economy. The owners of the precinct have got planning permission for 30 more uh, new retail units uh, on the car park um, and uh, you know, that will mean not only uh, uh, the jobs in the shops that when they, when they do eventually get built and uh, are open but it also means jobs in the construction trade as well. Should the plans go ahead this will almost certainly drive economic prospects for a neglected city and improve the reputation of the area. However, some would say 
year, the initial costs of the rebuild will be expensive and cause an increase in council tax. It looks kind of old-fashioned. There's a lot of kind of drapes drawn down. It doesn't look very lit up. I think that with the right amount of money pumped into it, this could probably be quite a well-known shopping city. We're getting a lot of new houses in Salford now, and I think Salford precinct should be brought up to standard, the same as all the properties in Salford. There's some landlords... Uh, on about getting a 75 million investment and that's going to help local residents, so that's a good thing. By 2018, Pendleton will be a distinctive neighbourhood with a strong identity, a celebration of everything that is good about urban living. Jim Scott, Keys TV News, Salford. Here's one I made earlier. It's a popular phrase from all our childhoods and the Lowry Theatre's latest exhibition. Here's the very hard-working Jim Scott. Here's one I made earlier is an exhibition showcasing the history of BBC Children's Broadcasting. Hosted for the last three months at the Lowry Theatre in Salford Quays, this is the last week it will be open to the public. The exhibition, here's one we made earlier, was inspired really by having on our doorstep BBC Children's Television, who moved next to the Lowry a few years ago. The Lowry regularly does exhibitions that looks at performance in its broadest sense and we really want to start looking at television. So the idea to work with BBC Children's about an exhibition that looks at BBC Children's television seemed too good to pass up. The exhibition presents all the shows the station has produced over the last 90 years, as well as documenting the different mediums the station has adopted in order to stay up to date with its vastly changing audience. The show begins in the early 1920s where basically children sat in front of the radio while someone read them stories. Right up to the present day when children call the shots, they decide what they're going to watch and when they're going to watch it. My kids seldom sit in front of the telly. They'll watch television on the iPad, on the iPod, on the iPhone. With appearances from Bill and Ben, Bagpuss, Teletubbies, Crackerjack, Puzzle Brush, Newsround and Blue Peter, the treasured memories of the British people's childhoods have been reminiscent and valued this summer. The exhibition runs until Sunday the 12th of October and is free to the public to explore. Jim Scott, Keys News. A Nobel Prize winning winner leading a revolution in Syria and a 13-year-old who achieved nuclear fusion in a school lab. They were among the speakers at TEDx Salford on Sunday. One of the more unusual talks at the Lowry Theatre came from Sophia Wallace, who spoke about clitoracy, the belief that knowledge of the clitoris empowers women and gives them freedom. Penny James caught up with her. I was thrilled that the organizers invited me not in the context of this is a women's issue, this is this um, private sexual matter. No, this is, a, this is about our social discourse. This is about um, the issues of our time and ideas that need to be spread. And certainly, literacy is an idea that needs to be spread. As long as a female body is treated as shameful and taboo and only is allowed to exist, it's not allowed to have pleasure, women can't be free citizens. Now, what do you know about the working class movement in Manchester? Well, from 2015, you may know even less after the Department for Culture, Media and Sport are cutting £200,000 from the People's History Museum. Jamie here went down to find out more. Close to Deansgate, there is a lesser told history of the people of Manchester and of the UK as a whole. The People's History Museum shows the struggles of the working class. In 2010, the Department for Culture, Media and Sport announced that the museum will be facing a cut of around £200,000, due to take hold in April 2015. I spoke to Katie Ashton, Director of the People's History Museum, to see how they're planning on raising the money. And we've had uh, you know, lots of conversations with DCMS about that. We've explored a number of options through their support, which have been great. But as, as yet, we haven't yet got a, an alternative funding source in place. So we're due to lose around 15 to 20% of our turnover in 2015, which obviously for a museum of this size is going to have an impact on a range of, of aspects of the museum's work that we need to consider. And that 15 to 20%, that's estimated around £200,000, isn't that right? Yeah, it's, it's 
somewhere just under that. It's the, the actual figures obviously reduced over the last few years with, with small cuts that have been made. So we are working really hard to generate more of our own income and to replace the public sector funding with, with a wide range of, of sources from donations through to commercial income. Um, we've expanded the shop, for example. Katie Ashton says it's too early to tell exactly what impact the cut will have, but 15 to 20 per cent of the overall budget is significant. Toby Sargent at the Department for Culture, Media and Sport tried to explain what it might mean. Well, what it will mean is that it will need to find uh, an alternative source of funding, which is what we're trying to sort out at the moment. Uh, they are one of a number of museums that back in 2010, uh, institutions in fact, who we uh, identified as being ones that uh, could be streamlined in terms of their, uh, their sort of their, their, their funding. Uh, they are the only one of the, the groups that we identified that are left. Uh, and we are very much hoping that uh, either through the, uh, the local authority or through merging with another Sorry about the package there, it's just frozen on us, so we will get that up on the website for you so you can watch it in full. So now joining us in the studio is our political editor, editor <laughs> Dan McLaughlin. Thank you for coming in, Dan. You froze there for a minute. I said. did, I did. So can you tell me, what are going to be the political implications for the loss in funding? Well, the thing is about the museum, um, it wasn't a performance issue. When it first opened after its renovation, um, it attracted about 80,000 visitors. Now it's about 100,000 visitors, so it can't be argued that it's a performance issue. Now the political implications is, this is the only museum in the country, in the UK, about the working class movement. Um, I think Len McCluskey, the leader of um, Unite, argued that you might have several museums about lawnmowers and multiple ones about Mormite and stuff like that, but there's only one about the working class movement, and that's something that might be extinguished with a lack of funding. So, Dan, we understand as well it's come to the end of conference season. Can you tell us a wee bit more about what the party leaders have been saying at their conference speeches? Well, it's been interesting. Obviously, 2015 is the general election year. It's when they're all trying to get back into power. And um, so we've had the Lib Dem conference finish um, lately. Nick Clegg looking like he was um, resigned to the doll queue. <laughs> he was uh, talked about, it sounded like it was his greatest hits album. Um, he, like he was resigned to quit. And what about the other leaders, Dan? Um, David Cameron wanted to get back into power. He mentioned um, human rights and um, Ed Miliband about the NHS. Excellent. Uh, thanks very much, Dan. Thank you for coming and talking to us today. Thank, Thank you. you. Now we're over to Cameron Kulavuz with all the latest sports news. Sorry, man. Good to chat off with you. by Sadden, who should have had his second goal of the day. The chance eventually fell to his strike partner Maidley, whose hard stroke finish made sure Salford made it 27 points out of a possible 29 so far this season. Now members of a Manchester United fan page have taken matters into their own hands to try and win back an old superstar. Amber Hack went to Old Trafford to find out what the rest of Manchester really thought of this cunning stunt. After the mass speculation of Cristiano Ronaldo returning to the club, Facebook fan page United Real raised £3,000 for a banner to fly over the Madrid versus Villarreal match, asking Ronaldo to come home to United. So why exactly did they choose to do this? Um, yeah, basically started off with one of the members um, uh, putting the idea on the wall um, and they got a lot of likes, a lot of comments. Ollie then set up an account for anyone who was in favour of the, the banner to, to donate, whatever they felt comfortable with, um, and it just snowballed from there really. But what did the Old Trafford faithful really think of the stunt? I think it's embarrassing actually. Don't, don't get me wrong, I'd love him back and all, all the Reds would, but saying please come back, you know what I mean? Personally, I think it looks a little bit desperate to be fair. I don't think it's embarrassing. It's nice for him to know that he's always welcome back. I don't think he needed telling that. I thought he was fantastic when he came here with Real Madrid and he knows we love him and he knows we'd love to have him back. However, United Real maintained that they did not mean to cause any grief between the fans or towards the players. 
Uh, it's more of a mark of appreciation. Um, I can understand why certain fans have the views they do, uh, and they would play that, oh, well, why would you not put something like a Glazers Out uh, banner instead? Uh, but I think uh, of the generation... Joining me in the studio, I've got Lewis Smith to discuss the Super League Grand Final. So, Lewis, can you tell us a bit about these sides? Well, I think with this final, with every Super League Grand Final, it's not really the best of the best of the Grand Final, you can take that for most part of the time. The issue is, for the most part, that's going to get it. Because the history in this game is absolutely incredible. You've got two art lives and you're moving into the home and you're going to have a home. And it's going to be the most hopefully for the match of the team. And who are the two key players by the team? We've probably got two of the best in the division, as you'd expect with your grand final. Probably for Wigan, the standout man, McElroy, but they've also got some players coming in. That Really do some sorry guys, sorry folks, we're having some, some trouble there, we're going to have to come back to the studio here. Alright, thanks very much though, thank you. Apologies there, so we're going to head over to Helen now, who hopefully is going to show us some pretty nice weather for the weekend. Might be a change for us. Okay, so instead we're going to go to a charity package where a person who is diagnosed with dementia often suffers, often, often feels vulnerable and in need of reassurance and support. People from across the UK are joining together to raise awareness of this. A recent event at Salford Quay saw a 56-year-old sufferer fly across the water on a zip wire. Steph Brunzel reports. It is easy to assume that dementia mostly affects our older generation. However, there are 40,000 young people living with dementia in the UK. I was diagnosed when I was 55 and we just need to get the message out there that you don't have to be old to live with dementia. Just over a year after being diagnosed, Joy is raising awareness by taking a leap of faith, quite literally. A lot of people before this zip wire said, are you sure Joy should be doing this? She's got Alzheimer's. And of course that was for me like a red rag to a bowl. You know, someone tells me you can't do something, I do it. And especially if they say you can't do something because you've got Alzheimer's, well, watch me. <laughs> One, two. say, all the advertising say, you can live well with dementia. And I'm here living proof. I'm chuffed to bits that I've actually done it. <laughs> I've gained confidence in doing it and I hopefully got out a message that, you know, try. Don't, don't give up, don't sort of, when you get your diagnosis, don't sit back and say, you know, this is the end. It's not, it's the beginning of a new journey. Steph Brunzel, Keys News. So now we will join Helen with the weather. So over to you, Helen. Thanks very much, Sophie. We've got a mixed few days to come ahead. With the rain we've had this morning, it's going to carry on into the afternoon. Some of these are going to be thundery. Quite squally, but for the weekend, it looks like we're going to have some sunshine. So this afternoon, there will be some scattered heavy showers, but these are likely to turn even worse as the evening goes on. Some of these are going to turn really blustery, quite gusty, but temperatures around 15 degrees. Winds will start to drop in the evening and hopefully we'll see some dry spells overnight. However, these dry spells could lead to um, temperatures dropping to around three degrees, meaning there could be a risk of dew, some mist around and some fog tomorrow morning. Now, tomorrow morning starts off quite nice. Um, temperatures going up to around 14, 15 degrees, which are quite nice for this time of year. It'll start off fine, quite dry, but as the afternoon goes on, these will turn again into the wet and rain. Now, as we go into Saturday and Sunday for the weekend, we have a high pressure system joining us over the weekend. 
This will mean that better c conditions are going to happen. So hopefully some sunnier weather. Back to you, Sophie. Thanks very much, Helen. Now that's all from us here today at Keys TV News. Follow all the latest news stories on our Twitter page, at Keys News, or our website, keysnews.net. We'll see you next Tuesday at the same time. Goodbye.